Okay, well, good, afternoon. good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the weekly seminar series at the Adla Institute for Global Health Research. My name is Professor Mary Viktorovich, and I'm the acting director of the Dadala Institute for Global Health Research while James Rabinsky is away on sabbatical. So today we're delighted to host Mark Terry who will be leading today's seminar entitled Planetary Health Film Seminar, uh, sorry, Planetary Health Film Lab 2023 Debrief, the Belize edition with Mark Terry. And as is our usual practice, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous land that we're on. So as this is a hybrid event and some of us are on different territories, please take the time to give thanks and respect to the land on which you're currently living and working. So today we're here on the York University campus in Toronto that's situated on the traditional territorial area known as Toronto, and we acknowledge its current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We acknowledge this as the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations, including the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. So let's begin with a brief introduction to our speaker. Mark Terry is a contract faculty member in the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York and serves as the chair of the Advanced Disaster Emergency and Rapid Reef Response Simulation, known as Adderson and the Arctic Group, and associate to the UNESCO Chair for Reorienting Education Towards Sustainability. He's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, and the Explorers Club. Uh, Mark has worked with the United Nations since 2011 on the Youth Climate Report, a database of youth-made films, providing films of global scientific research to its annual climate summits. He's received numerous awards for his work, including his pioneering documentary remediation for the UN, uh, which earned him the Gemini Humanitarian Award from the Academy of Canadian Cinema and Television. He's also been decorated by Queen Elizabeth for his work with the Diamond Jubilee Medal and by the Explorers Club with its Stephenson Medal. So in today's seminar, Mark will be sharing the events that took place at this year's Planetary Health Film Lab in Belize. This project works with Indigenous youth to train them to tell stories on how climate change impacts them and their communities. A few themes at this year's Planetary Film Lab touches upon include food, sovereignty, taking climate action and sustainable land use. The films have been reviewed by the UN and added to the Youth Climate Report. They will also be showcased at the, at the 2023 UN Climate Change Conference COP28 in Dubai. So as this is a one hour event that will end at 2 p.m., um, we'll start with a 20 minute presentation from Mark and then this will be followed by screening of a selection of films, approximately 10 to 15 minutes, and a 15 minute question and discussion period towards the end. We'll wrap up and conclude the seminar around 1.55 p.m. And just for a reminder for our guests joining in person, please note there are microphones along the table that will pick up sound in the room. And those who are viewing via Zoom, please note the second seminar is being recorded Please mute your microphone unless presenting or asking or answering a question. And please use the raise hand button or chat function to ask a question. I'd now like to ask Mark to begin his presentation. Over to you. Thank you, Mary. And hi, everybody. It's so nice to be back in the, the boardroom again, or the presentation room, I guess, is what this really is, at the Dottley Institute. And, um, um, and hi to everybody who's watching from home. <laughs> I hope you enjoy this uh, presentation. Uh, this is the fourth edition of the Planetary Health Film Lab. Uh, this is an ongoing research project of the Dottley Institute. And uh, this particular year, we, um, we focused on the Indigenous youth in Belize. And um, this was um, a very interesting project because uh, we had so much collaboration this year. We had some wonderful partners in Belize and um, 
and we had lots of people here from York, uh, Jim Stinson in particular, who spent quite a bit of time in Belize, um, and the Young Lives Research Lab, Kate Tilichek, I see you're here online, thank you for being here. And, um, and because of, of all that kind of collaboration and, uh, and joint effort, uh, we had six wonderful films uh, come out of the lab this year that I plan to present at COP28. So uh, without further ado, let's get into my presentation. This is a picture of the deer dance. Um, you're going to see more about this from uh, one of the films, I believe. Uh, this was a screen grab from one of the films, and that's the, um, the indigenous people of Belize, uh, not necessarily the filmmakers. <laughs> so a little bit of background. Uh, the Planetary Health Film Lab, now in its fourth year, is a research project co-led by James Orbinski, Kate Tilichek, Deborah McDonald, and myself. The collaborating partners are Jim Stinson and Charles Hopkins. In the months from May to July, filmmaking training sessions via Zoom were provided and participants began to collect interview footage and B-roll for their films. That's all part of the training. We show them how to make these uh, short little films. They're only about three to five minutes in length, uh, but part of it includes um, interviewing practices and the collection of B-roll. Uh, B-roll is um, footage um, of things outside of the interview. So if the interview subject is talking about forests or animals, then um, the young filmmakers would get shots of the forest animals and cover the speaker while he's talking. A week-long workshop educated participants in the areas of planetary health, global environmental policy participation with the United Nations, professional documentary filmmaking, youth empowerment, digital storytelling, and land-based solutions in Indigenous communities. Those were the um, topics that uh, were part of our workshop. And each participant produced a documentary short film profiling planetary health issues in their communities. Each film produced in the program uh, was then submitted to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change for consideration to be added to the Youth Climate Report database of videos. Uh, produced by the Global Community of Youth. Happy to say that all films this year have been approved. And for those unfamiliar with the Youth Climate Report, uh, it's a digital database run by the UNFCCC, and it contains about 750 videos made by the Global Community of Youth. Now they have six more. Ah, as I said, <laughs> the database now has more than 750 films, and those added this year will be presented at COP28 in December. Planetary Health Film Lab was originally funded by a grant from the Canadian government's so Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, SHRC, and is now supported by the Peterborough K.M. Hunter Charitable Foundation. Partners, and we have a lot of them. Uh, each year, the Planetary Health Film Lab um, works with its partners from the Young Lives Research Lab the Faculty of Education here at York, and its Partnership for Youth and Planetary Well-Being. That's a project that they have right here at York. Um, the Planetary Health Alliance out of Harvard University. The UNESCO Chair for Reorienting Education Towards Sustainability. That chair is seated here at York University. And of course, the Youth Climate Report. The project also partners each year with local indigenous organizations and educational institutions in the country that we're working in. This year in Belize, we partnered with the Julian Cho Society, an NGO in southern Belize devoted to indigenous rights, and the Toledo um, Alcaldes Association, a traditional representative body of the Maya people in southern Belize. Now, every year that we do this, we try to steer our participants towards three major themes. Um, the first is planetary health. Several films address this theme by depicting uh, the land being sick and connecting their relationship to the land as affecting their own health. For example, um, droughts contribute to lower yield of crops and therefore less food for the community. Another theme is global health and humanitarianism. Other films recognized. Um, how they're 
yeah, how their stories could assist other indigenous communities around the world. And they shared their experiences and solutions to improve the health conditions of other global communities. I'm just going to go back. Sorry, everybody. Now, the second one here is very important because um, in the past when we've showed our films um, that are based in indigenous communities at COP, other indigenous communities from other countries often got ideas about the land-based solutions that can apply to their own experiences. So it was a very great way of um, mobilizing our knowledge from one indigenous community to another. And the third theme, of course, is global health foresight. Some films identify the causes of planetary health issues in their communities, pointing their finger at capitalistic interests in nearby mining projects, for example. Uh, local youth can be seen mobilizing and planning to defend their land against these projects and, by example, encouraging other communities to do the same. So here's uh, our original group. Uh, these are some of the participants and some of the crew that they worked with. Uh, we had six Indigenous youth from Belize participating officially. Their films were made in the native languages of Kekchi. About one million people uh, speak that language worldwide. And Mopan, only 13,000 people speak Mopan worldwide. These ancient languages are Mayan in origin and are rarely spoken outside of Belize and Guatemala, Central America. In 2023, marks the second year of the UN's International Decade of Indigenous Languages. Uh, there's always a call uh, at, COP, uh, at, at the COPs during this decade to present um, as much information as possible in these native Indigenous languages as much as possible. And so I'm, I'm very happy that we're able to use these rarely spoken languages and give them an international forum. Now these are the participants. Uh, we had Florinio Zuc up in the corner there, Viola Kuss, and Christy Cho, Ernesto Pau, Sebastian Cho, and Nazario Peck. No relation to Gregory. <laughs> and um, here we are during a B-roll collection. They're out in the forest there. These are some of the filmmakers and the crew out finding things that are related to the interview subjects um, and what they had to talk about. And this is them quite literally <laughs> crawling through the forest, collecting their B-roll. Now then we had a, a workshop, and we had it in this um, educational institution called the Tamul Kin Center of Learning in Belize. So with the local partners, Julian Chow Society and the Toledo um, Alcaldez Association, we were able to secure the indigenous educational facility called the Tamul Kin Center of Learning in Blue Creek, Belize, for our week-long uh, workshop. The center is a non-governmental Maya organization that promotes sustainable development with identity through intercultural education, training, and research, combining modern and Maya values, knowledge, and philosophy. So the speakers, um, we had eight speakers all together uh, during this uh, week-long workshop. And for the first two days, we had uh, myself talking about documentary filmmaking and digital storytelling. Uh, Charles Hopkins, who is the chair of the, of the UNESCO chair for uh, reorienting education towards sustainability here at York. And he spoke about youth engagement with the United Nations. And we had Jim Stinson right here speaking about decolonizing planetary health. And finally, Deborah McDonald. Uh, she's part of the Young Lives Research Lab here at York. Uh, she's based in Spain, and she spoke about youth empowerment. So the local Indigenous speakers we had for the next two days were Derry Choco from Belize, um, the role of young Maya people in making the future we dream. Now, we're going to see that theme come up a couple more times because we had three speakers on the same subject. Elodio Rash, uh, he spoke about the, the same theme, and... Roberto Coos, who spoke about that as well. I should point out that Elodio Rash was extremely helpful to us. He was um, an on-the-ground collaborator that organized everything in Belize uh, with the participants and the various places where we, uh, we did our work. So uh, big thanks to him. 
and Juan Cao, uh, who spoke on the power of social media. So those were the <coughs> topics that we um, that we discussed during our workshop. Now this is um, this is the entrance to the workshop, and um, and that's actually this kind of rounded center you can see here with a big screen over there. And if you look closely, I think that's me on the screen. <laughs> And, uh, and everybody kind of sat in the circular fashion while they um, listened to the presentations. And we had other presentations where they would just stand uh, right beside the screen. And we had these nifty t-shirts. I don't know if you can uh, see that. It says Ind Indigenous Wellbeing for Planetary Health and all the various logos of the participants, including the Donnelly Center is there, right? Did you notice that? The bottom one on the right. And here's some more shots. There's Kate Tillichek uh, giving her address on the screen while everyone else is uh, sitting around taking notes and watching. And then this final picture shows the, them working on their actual films in the workshop. Uh, this is when post-production is expected to be done, and they're lining up the B-roll with, um, uh, with the interview footage. Now, where to see the films? I'm going to show two of them today but there's too many to show all of them today. But if you do want to see all of them, all six films with English subtitles have been uploaded to the Youth Claim Reports YouTube channel. Now these films have been approved by the UNFCCC, as I mentioned, and also uploaded to the Youth Claim Report GIS database, which you can find there. Now this PowerPoint, by the way, will be made available, so you don't have to feverishly write down links um, if you're if I'm going too fast. <laughs> and the films can also be seen right here at this big complicated link. And there's the various partners. The UNFCCC is the first logo, then the Youth Climate Report, York University, of course, the Dottley Institute, the Young Lives Research Lab, and the um, UNESCO Chair, and then the Planetary Health Alliance of Harvard University. Going forward, where are the films going to go now that we have them made? Well, the first one is the Imagine Native Film Festival. Uh, you probably are familiar with this here in Toronto. It has a long history. All six films will participate in this year's Imagine Native Indigenous Film and Media Arts Festival in Toronto and can be viewed through the festival's MediaTek portal. Okay. The second one is the Regional Conference of Youth on October 31st. A presentation will be made on the opening day of the Regional Conference of Youth, a UN event that draws on data provided by youth on a continental basis to draft a global youth statement for COP28. Now, this is a relatively new thing. Uh, the global youth statement uh, is an official policy statement that's uh, presented to the policymakers and negotiators and all the delegates that attend the COP conferences. This is only the third year they've done this. The first year was in Glasgow. Last year was in uh, Egypt, and uh, this year um, they're going to be doing this. Now, the, the great thing about our films is we're attending this particular conference where the issues addressed in the films will inform the global youth statement this year. And finally, of course, COP28 itself, November 30th to December 12th. Uh, at COP28, a series of side events and panels uh, will showcase the films from December 1st to 10th. And a press conference is already scheduled for Friday, December the 1st at 10 a.m. Dubai time. Mark that in your calendar. Now, I, I'm hoping we have some people from Belize who might actually be able to come to COP this year. Uh, Elodio, who I mentioned before, uh, is trying to get there. And if they are there, they're going to participate in the press conference sitting at the, uh, on the DS with myself. And the Microfilm Festival, this is another part of the Planetary Health Film Lab every year. This is when we have the first public exhibition of the films made in the lab. And we also present the, uh, the filmmaking participants with their certificate of completion. So it's at this event that all participating filmmakers receive their certificates. certificates. Uh, they also get an opportunity to take questions from the audience and media attending for uh, the first public exhibition of their films. Now this year, 
Um, there's a Belize cultural event taking place, a special festival in December. And usually we have our micro film festival right after the workshop, but we decided to participate in their cultural festival instead this year in December. So it'll be a much uh, bigger event. And that's December the 18th. If you happen to be in Belize at that time, please join us. <laughs> okay, now the films. So we're going to take a look at uh, the first one by Ernesto Pau called Climate Change and Action. So we just take a here we go. In the Maya village of Alunca, that is found in the jewel of Belize, where the biodiversity flourishes. Farming isn't just a way of life, it is the lifeblood of the community. Connecting our traditions with the land we hold sacred. Farming is so important, um, and the Maya people depend on the farm, depend on farming, and that is the way um, our, our life is, and that is the way how we live. Most of the Maya people are farmers, even even though some of them are teachers, policemen, soldiers, but they still do farming. You need to plant your own food and to eat with the food at the market right now are very expensive. And canned goods are not healthy, so we need to eat fresh fruits or vegetables that come from our farm. But now, because of climate change, the village is dealing with dying crops, drought, severe floods, and problems with the germination of crops, just to name a few. This has made things even more difficult for the Maya community, especially when it comes to their food and livelihood. Our Maya people are um, used to their planting seasons, but nowadays um, we see that um, those seasons or those uh, time that we used to is not there anymore. It changed the rotation of our planting and even the harvesting. That is the effect of the um, climate change. One of the biggest challenges here was drought. A long dry season and affect the corn, the rice that's supposed to be harvested. But now corn is short. I know rice will be short. And then I know the price of food will be very high. To survive, the Maya communities depend heavily on the land, forest, and its resources. It offers food a source of fresh air, shelter, and a timeless connection that bonds their past, present, and future together. Forests are very important. They're important to the animals, to people. The air, forest is the lungs of the earth. It cleans all the chemicals, the gases that we have in the environment. We don't use tractors, we don't use bulldozers to damage the soil and the air. As in air pollution, we basically use our stick to plant, and then we don't plant acres, like thousands of acres. We plant maybe like one and two just to sustain ourselves. We as Mayas, we don't do um, large scale and we don't really destruct. I think we are way behind managing our resources very carefully. So if we go into the forest, we don't um, go and exploit it. We just get our uh, whatever resources we need in the forest to get it at a, a reasonable, uh, sustainable harvest. We have a, a system that we follow, which is we call the um, forest use permit. That way we, 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 we are using, and then we have our people down. If they want to uh, extract lumber now, we ask them to, to apply. So they apply, and then the, the, the leaders look at it. Uh, and then as long as there is no problem, then we, we grant them permit. And using the permit, they can harvest their lumber. Using that permit will help us protecting it so that we don't exploit it, we don't, do over, we don't go over harvesting. My strong message is to let us protect our forest by educating one another. How, how do we go about using resources in the forest? As the villagers unite to battle increasing effects of climate change, they realize that not only their survival, but the very essence of their existence depends on educating all generations about learning how to use the forest resources wisely. 
Remember, a healthy forest is a healthy people and a healthy community. I really like that final drone shot. Yes. <laughs> And yes, let's have a round of applause for Ernesto. And the next film. By Nazario Peck, uh, To Be Maya, To Be Well. serve as an indispensable cornerstone within the Mayan community, fulfilling practical, social, and cultural needs. These traditional structures not only provide essential shelters, but also weave together the threads of communion, unity, and cultural heritage among the Mayan people well being. The forest acts as a natural hardware store enabling the Maya community to get all the resources they need to construct these buildings. Working together to build touch houses holds great importance for the Maya people. When they join forces, they strengthen their community's unity and shared goal. These teamwork goes beyond just making homes. It also keeps their tradition alive and helps them learn important skills together. By building houses as a group, they share knowledge between generations and become more resilient as a community. This way, they can finish building houses faster and have more time for farming, art, and other important activities.
overall, my people teamwork in building Dutch houses shows how coming together benefits everyone and keeps their culture thriving. Okay, let's hear it from Nazario. All right, so that uh, that basically concludes my presentation part of today. And um, I, I should also point out that the collection of films, uh, the fact that there are six films, uh, represents in documentary terms uh, a database project where, it, where each film is relatively on the same theme, but they all have different voices. There's different directors for each one, therefore you have different storytelling and different content all related to the same theme. Uh, this becomes important later on when these um, films are geolocated um, based on year and location. Uh, we can do spatial and temporal analyses with each other. And, and by doing that, sometimes implicit narratives emerge and we discover new data. Um, data that the individual films themselves don't necessarily say, but when we compare them to each other, then we see uh, new information. So this is um, a kind of a microcosm version of the database project, which is the Youth Climate Report, with its 750 films from all seven continents. And so this gives us a very good idea of what, um, uh, what's being experienced in Belize and how indigenous communities are responding to these uh, climate impacts and planetary health issues. This becomes important when doing a search on the Youth Climate Report by other indigenous communities around the world, if they want to see um, how those communities are handling similar problems. Uh, it might actually be inspiring and help uh, other communities as well. So, um, on that note, if there's any uh, questions or discussion, from anybody either online or here in person. Yeah. Thank you, Mark, for the great presentation that you were sharing with someone last week. Uh, something you said at the beginning really intrigued me, which is the, the, the sharing of these films at COP and the other fora, where different groups of indigenous people from around the world are, are convening, can have, uh, have the potential to cross-fertilize yeah. um, place-based solutions. But so much of what we, and I'm not an anthropologist at all, so my understanding is very amateur at best. So much of what we understand about the, the value and power of indigenous knowledge is place-based. It's context-specific. It's, it's learning and culture that's emerged over millennia yeah. about how to survive and thrive in a particular environment. The full application of the human intellect and genius and creativity in that particular environment. Yeah. So how, how does that work when you have communities around the world in very different contexts? sharing their particular place-based solutions. Are there success stories of this translation happening? Is it theoretical that that could happen? What's been the experience you've seen so far with that? Well, um, I'll tell you one really good example of that um, after, but at first, when indigenous communities have relatively the same sort of environment, then um, um, the examples of one community will certainly inform um, those of another. Uh, but when they're different, it'll be more of the methodology of trying to find a solution. And usually the land-based solutions um, done by indigenous communities anywhere in the world is very communal, where everybody is coming together, like we saw in this last film, you know, 30 men are needed to build a home sort of thing. And, and that sort of uh, process um, is common with all indigenous communities. What they do, um, taking that approach, um, can be unique to that community, but when the environment is similar, then we can see some, some crossover and perhaps some new ideas in forming another. Now, the great example I have uh, isn't so much a, um, an example of, of an indigenous land problem, but it was a, a problem dealing with um, the disposal of rubber tires. And this was um, 
uh, a young filmmaker from Mexico who was walking to school every day, and he saw this massive uh, pile of uh, tires, and he, he didn't like seeing that. And it always seemed to him that it was always there. And whenever he asked, how can we get rid of these or break them down or dispose of them, the answer was always, nothing we can do. They're just going to sit there forever. So he saw a, um, I think it was a YouTube video, where these machines that crush anything you put in it, you might have seen those videos, right? Um, he thought, well, why don't I try that with the tires? And so he was throwing the tires in, and, and what these machines would do is turn it into a little mulch. And he would take this, uh, this, this mulch of rubber, and he built a um, mold of a brick, put them all in, put it in the kiln, right? Heated it up, and he made rubber bricks. Mm -hmm. And with these rubber bricks, uh, the community was able to build homes mm -hmm. with these. Now, here's a very different um, community in Africa. There was a delegate that attended the COP conference that year from Kenya who saw the video and went, we have the same problem, disposing of rubber tires. What a great solution to build homes for our community as well. So even though they're very different, um, the one thing they had in common was the disposal of rubber tires, and, and this solution from Mexico actually informed the solution for Kenya. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. Um, I see Harvey yeah. has a question. Um, hello, Mark. Um, hi. Who am I talking to? Oh, hi, Harvey. Yeah. yeah. I wish I could be there in person today, but I'm uh, still recovering from some ankle surgery. Um, I'm always so inspired by, by the work of you and your colleagues, uh, and, you know, over the years, and um, it's really profound, and it's all, a, to me, the core storytelling, and that's such a powerful way to learn, and that's indigenous wisdom, how it gets passed on. You bring it to life through the videos. But my question, um, do you build into your evaluation looking at the impact it has on the youth participants at, at a personal level? I mean, fostering confidence, their leadership, uh, their resiliency, and, and even following up um, one or two years later, just seeing um, what they're doing, and and I'm just curious. Are, are, are you really? Because it must you must see it. It must be profound. And and when they come together, copy just seeing it, that must be profound. But are, are you studying? Are you capturing that as well as other parts of, of your research? Yes. Yeah, so one of the things Planetary Health Film Lab endeavors to do is to um, encourage the participants to continue to use the filmmaking skills they've learned in our lab well after um, that particular lab for that year has ended. And, um, and yes, we are following up with all the participants. A lot of them are my friends on Facebook, for example, and, uh, and we keep the, um, the open hub. We have a group on Facebook that they're all part of, and, and this is one of the great things about social media this way, is all the participants from all the years who are members of that Facebook group are sharing their own experiences from one year to the next. And then we're able to see the new films that they're making long after their participation in our film lab has ended. And, um, and the importance of, of giving them these skills is, is what they appreciate is they now have a new creative force at their disposal. Um, instead of writing a letter or drawing a picture, they now can use film to tell their stories. And by giving them the exposure at COP through the United Nations, it, it encourages them and inspires them to continue this work because they know their films are going to have a great end use. They're not, not just going to be uploaded to YouTube and, and get 23 likes and then ignored. Uh, they're actually serving a purpose that informs and influences international environmental policymakers. And that gives them the, the desire to continue the work well after our film lab is over. Can I just add to that, Mark? Yeah, yeah, please, Jim. Yeah, yeah. Um, Harvey, it's Jim Stinson here. One thing I just wanted to add to that, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, our team's going back down to Belize in December um, with Mark, myself, and other members of the Young Lives Research Lab team. And we're going to be doing some of that evaluation that you were just talking about. We're going to be doing talking circles uh, with the young filmmakers, their family members, community leaders and members of the partner organization that we are working with. We're going to be doing debriefing with them at that point to, to try to get a better sense of 
uh, what they have got out of the project, what the benefits have been, um, and so forth. Um, I will say with the, with the young people that we've worked with in Belize, um, specifically the six filmmakers um, that produce films, I think the, the, the benefits and the outcomes of this project have been really um, significant. I know um, the area that we've been working in Belize is, is fairly remote. There aren't a lot of economic opportunities for Indigenous youth in the area outside of farming. Um, and all of the young people that we've been working with on this project have subsequently been working with the partner organization, the Julian Cho Society, in communications roles. They've been uh, conducting interviews with, with elders and community members for the Julian Cho Society. They're actually working on a whole new series of, of videos um, at the moment and getting paid to do that by the Julian Cho Society. So it's provided them with actually a set of skills that they can use um, you know, to make money and generate income for themselves, which I think has been really important. In addition to like, you know, the, the research skills, the interviewing skills, the leadership skills that they've gotten th through this project as well. So I think the benefits have been really great. And I think um, that's something that we're going to be following up on from a research perspective again, when we go back in December. Yeah, I think it's really powerful in that you, uh, you know, research can really help to, uh, you know, they've trained this collective and the collective action that they could undertake anyway. Thank you very much. Great. Um, uh, Kate, I believe you had a question, if you'd like to go ahead. Thanks, Mary. Actually, I was I was going to say something similar to what Jim uh, just did. So so that was great. Um, and it's part two, Harvey and others, of the larger project, which is the Partnership for Youth and Planetary Wellbeing, so that these films can work um, to fulfill the obligations of the Youth Climate Report and the lab, but also we're able to look at the films and do analysis of the films, as well as, as Jim and Mark are saying, entrance and exit surveys and interviews to really see at the individual level, that is to say, how were, how is this process helping you with climate anxiety or eco-anxieties or issues at the individual level, at the community level, and at the larger level? So it is part of... Um, this larger conversation that we're having that's an intergenerational benefit um, both within and across indigenous and other youth communities um, at the moment we're working in the americas on that so it's, it's a great question though I, I do believe as jim and mark said there are a, a lot of benefits um, that we need to get out into the literature and to share with folks um, so that they can learn from them as well Thank you, Kate. That's great. And I wanted to uh, mention more in this regard is uh, some of the uh, success stories of previous participants. Um, our very first planetary health film lab, um, Kai Milan, was a uh, filmmaker from Australia. And when he worked on his film, he learned um, enough to inspire him to want to continue doing this professionally. So he set up a company in Australia, uh, in Queensland, um, called Life Media. And he kind of does the same thing, using the skills that he learned from the Planetary Health Film Lab to train other young people uh, in Australia to make these uh, social issue documentaries, not necessarily always about uh, the environment, but about other issues that are important to young people. So he's been doing that for the past four years. And he has a whole collection of the very similar films that come out of that. So um, there's the occasional um, success story that continues to keep going. Same with um, the Ecuador filmmakers. A lot of them are continuing um, to make films for their respective universities as well as indigenous communities. Okay, great, great. Um, well, I have a question. Maybe I'll go ahead. Um, so uh, indigenous communities are at risk of decline, you know, all over the world in terms of their remaining in their natural context. I'm just wondering, uh, what, what process do you use to go about choosing which ones you'll work with? Well, it's, it's kind of a, an organic process, really. We try to find indigenous communities that um, um, 
that are scattered throughout the world. We don't want to have the same one every year, so, so we look transnationally to find um, other uh, Indigenous communities that might be different from the ones that we've ever worked with before. Um, our second planetary health film lab was with um, Indigenous communities in the circumpolar Arctic, for example and very different stories that came out of that because it's a very different environment. Um, the third year we used, um, uh, we looked at South America and focused on Ecuador, and we had uh, two different kinds of um, languages, uh, indigenous languages, as they were represented by 11 different indigenous communities throughout the country. Some of them living deep in the Amazon jungle, some living in the mountains, some living by the shore. Um, so we, we all had these different experiences, but still within a certain geographic area. And, um, and Belize, of course, was Central America, so that's different too. Um, I was asked recently, where are you looking for next year? And uh, we were looking at the Aboriginal people in Australia. Um, we haven't settled on anything yet, and, and there's um, uh, some of our partners are working in other parts of the world as well, so we might examine those um, indigenous communities, but we're trying to find the ones that have different uh, geographic and environmental um, concerns in, in, in how they're handling it. And we also try to find communities that are relatively remote. Uh, we don't want to have communities that have been largely represented and they have lots of access to uh, resources, but the ones that are kind of scattered and, and uh, nobody really knows about, their stories are very important because um, the world knows very little about them. And so by presenting their films and their uh, rarely spoken languages at the, at the United Nations Climate Summit, um, it, it gives them an international forum that they never had before. So that, that's kind of our criteria when we're selecting participants. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I don't see inside the room. I'm just wondering if there are, are any questions or comments. No, I don't think so, Mary. A question in the chat? Or... Oh. oh, yeah. I, I was just going to say, if you want to see all six films, the, there's a link, and boom, there it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, I had clicked on that a few minutes ago, and that's what uh, the music had come up. So I had to silence myself. But yeah, I look, definitely look forward to uh, seeing those. Yeah. And I also just want to reiterate and, and acknowledge um, all the help that we had this year. We had great partners from here at York University. Uh, Jim Stinson did an amazing job down there in, in Belize. Um, Kate Tilichek and um, Deborah McDonald were great support as well uh, from the Young Lives Research Lab and in their own research project. And, um, and of course, all the, the members from the community down there. Uh, they were great in setting up the infrastructure and the follow-up that takes place afterwards. Sometimes that's the toughest kind of collaboration to get because once a project is over, uh, the tendency is to walk away. But but to have that kind of um, commitment all the way through was uh, extremely valuable. So I just want to thank and acknowledge um, everybody that helped out this year. Right, and just in terms of the communities, um, have you? I believe you've worked with um, youth in the Canadian North as well, or? Yes, in, in the circumpolar Arctic, uh, we call it. But uh, yes, uh, a lot of the Inuit we worked with here, but also um, um, other indigenous youth from uh, Europe and Alaska, uh, not necessarily Canada. And, um, and so we try to, um, to cover as much of the planet as possible uh, with these respective in indigenous communities, because they, they all have a similar story to tell, but different, very different at the same time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, great to see the stories told and um, yeah, what can unfold, you know, um, out of it and the examples that you gave of you know the rubber rubber bricks building houses yeah. also, also you know the youth themselves it's sort of empowerment building skills and who knows what they'll do with it in the future right 
Yeah, well, we've had some examples of um, of them doing it not just on their own uh, for fun and posting on social media, but within some kind of, of new organization, whether it's the professional organization in Australia I, I talked about, or whether it's um, other indigenous communities, uh, like in um, uh, in Ecuador, the, the Quechua Academy for the Humanities is now having a very similar um, program that they do every year. And, and the great thing is all these new films that take place with our graduates um, can be seen on the Facebook group page for the Planetary Health Film Lab. And so we see this ongoing uh, uh, process continue well after our film labs are over. Yeah, right. They, they take a life take on a life of their own, I guess. Yeah, yeah they do. Yeah. And I, I'm very encouraged that they feel inspired to do so because, you know, it's an awful lot of work uh, when they're making these films. They have to do research. They have to interview people. They have to look at the raw footage. They have to edit. They have to find B-roll. They, they have to spell the names correctly of everybody in the credits. Like there's absolutely an awful lot of work, even music selection sometimes. And, and when young people are... are um, um, inducted with so much work in a, a short period of time that they tend to say, when it's over, I'm done with it. But the fact that they had such positive experiences that they want to continue uh, this productive creative labor well after the lab is over, I find that very inspiring. So, And I think we're doing something right because of it. <laughs> yeah, no, it truly is inspiring. So thank you so much, Mark, and thank you for members, members of the audience for your uh, comments and your interest. And so um, we'll conclude, but I do look forward to seeing you at our next event, which is on public awareness of One Health with Professor Carrie Wu. That's going to take place next Wednesday, October the 25th at 1 p.m. And so thank you again, everyone, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, Barry. Okay, thanks.